When you think of artworks by M.C. Escher, odds are the first thing that comes to mind are his drawings of physically impossible buildings, particularly relativity and waterfall. These are iconic, of course, but I've always been more interested in his symmetry and tessellation images. I've always found it rather mind-boggling how you'd be able to get these interlocking shapes in all of these different orientations. It turns out, of course, the answer is, you have to meticulously apply a bunch of geometrical rules. And it just so happens that I know a piece of software that's pretty good at applying geometrical rules. But before we dive into Houdini, let's make a choice about which type of tessellation we're going to recreate, because, as you can see, there are many. And to help us on our way, I found this incredibly useful website by folks at St. Louis University, where they've catalogued all the possible types of Escher-style tessellations. In particular, it's really nice that they have these little GIFs everywhere to explain exactly how the symmetry works. So let's scroll all the way down to one of my favorites. And that's this one right here, Sketch 25, Reptiles. And this uses rotation along a vertex. And if we look at the GIF itself, we see we need to do a few things. Firstly, we need to create a hexagon. Then we need to remove half of its lines. We need to do something to the other half to make them look interesting. And then we need to rotate those changed lines around one of the vertices to finish the shape. And then we put them all in an hexagonal grid where each shape is rotated in 120 degree increments to make the shapes interlock. And if we do this correctly, then you get an interlocking uh, pattern such as something like this, or uh, as you can probably tell, my background, because I really like tessellation. So now that we know how it works, let's go build this inside of Houdini. The first thing we'll need to do is create our hexagonal grid. Let's start with a regular grid. Just put it at two rows and two columns. That's all we need. And maybe let's use our overhead camera. Then we'll use a points from volume set to configure points in a tetrahedral way uh, with a point separation of, say, 0.32. Let's switch off uh, our grid for a second. Great. So now we have our hexagonal grid. Maybe let's increase our point size a little bit so that we can see what's going on. Now, if we want these tessellations to line up properly between the different lines, two things are going to be very important. One, that every line has the same number of points. And two, that the number of points on each line can be divided by three. Because if we have 120 degree increments, three times 120 is 360 degrees. Neither of that is true here. So let's put down a group sop. Set the group points and group in bounding regions. And we want to select some of these points at the edge here. These are some values that works for me in testing. And let's call this group delete me. And we're then going to blast this group. Now, if you count this out, you'll see that we have 27 points along each line and the same number of points on each line. If we look at the point numbers, we can see that they're ordered a little bit funnily. So let's put down a sort node. And let's sort these in Z. There we go. I much prefer that. Next, let's drop down a wrangle and quickly create an ID attribute. And let's follow this by a, with a group by range. And in this group by range, we're going to group the alternating lines. So we need to group points and we want to select 27 points out of each 54. And so we have our alternating lines. Let's call the top one um, row, first row. And let's split based on this group. And this way we can work on each set of alternating rows individually because the rotations will need to be slightly different in order to make things line up. Um, and so it's, uh, it's helpful to do this over two different branches of the tree. Next, we want to set it so that each point is rotated progressively in 120 degree increments. And for that, we need another angle. Let's start by creating a vector called R. And then we'll need to turn that into an orient attribute, which is a quaternion, so P at orient. And we'll use a Euler to quaternion. And as its first input, it needs the angle in radians. So that's radians R. 
and we need to give it the rotation order and for your standard xyz order you can put x form underscore but now we're rotating everything equally and we want to rotate it in these increments so we have to multiply our angle with our point number let's drop down a quick box and a copy the points to check that this is working And if we now rotate in Y, we see that they are progressively rotating. And if we put 120 degrees, we see that that is working correctly. Let's drop down a null. Let's call this grid one. And let's copy this into the other sets. And that's called grid two. That's our grids done. Now we need to create a shape. So we need to drop down a circle. Let's set it to be oriented in the ZX plane. Let's rotate it by 30 degrees and let's give it six divisions. We highlight this, we have a hexagon. It's a little bit too big at the moment. So for its scale, let's base that on our point separation here. So let's copy this parameter, a circle, let's paste relative reference and maybe divide it by two. Next, we want to cut this up into individual lines. So we can use a polycut, which will set to cut at every point. And if we hit the prim numbers, we can see that we now have individual primitives. We only want to have half of these primitives because the other half we're going to recreate after we've rotated them around the vertex. So we can so we can delete primitives by pattern and we can delete one, three, and five. And let's resample these remaining ones for good measure. Now let's get to work on our shape in a little bit more detail. Let's delete everything except for the first line. So everything except for line zero. Let's add a point jitter. And importantly, we need the first and the last points to stay in place. Otherwise, the rotation around the vertex doesn't work. So we have four points and we only need to run this over points one through three. That, that way, point four and point zero stay in place. Next, let's subdivide this to make it look a little bit nicer. Maybe uh, giving it two rounds of subdivisions. And actually, I don't like the look of this with one, three and five. So instead, let's take 0, 2, and 4. Doesn't matter much, but just prefer it this way. Drop down a null, and let's call this side 1. Now to get our corresponding side, we need to rotate this line around one of these endpoints. And we want to rotate it 120 degrees, and then merge it in with the original line. We need to set the pivots exactly where the 0 point is, So point zero, position P, and we want the first component, so the X, the second component, the Y, and the third component, the Z. We now have our pivot on the number zero, and we want to rotate this 120 degrees in Y. So 120 degrees, and merge that back with our original object. Essentially, we then want to just copy this across two more times and to do the same thing for everything that's not number one and everything that's not number two and merge all that back together. Some of these shapes are a little bit wonky, um, so that's something that you fix in the jitter. And so here are some values that worked for me before. Uh, I think I had 9.6, 15.4, and oh, maybe something like that. Now this should be a shape that tessellates. So let's check that, shall we? Let's turn off point display. Let's drop down a copy to points with our first grid and a copy to points with our second grid. And if we merge those together and zoom out a little bit, we'll see that it does not tessellate. And the reason for that is that 
the second line needs an additional rotation by 120 degrees. So if we add down another transform and rotate this 120 degrees, all of a sudden we have a tessellating shape. Now, the great thing about this setup is that Houdini makes it a lot easier to actually make Escher style representative shapes. So Escher had to imagine what the final result of his manipulations of each line might look like, but we can just ghost the final outcome as we're working on the individual lines. And we can see pretty much real time what the effect of those manipulations are on the final tessellation. So let's say we want to go back to our point jitter and maybe change the seed a little bit. We can see this having an effect in real time. So this takes the guesswork out of it a little bit or the artistic insight, I guess. And that is essentially our basic setup. But let's keep going. Let's do the morph that we had in the thumbnail of this video. So we, we go from uh, the full hexagon to this kind of a shape. First, we need to create matching hexagons for this morph. And in order to do that, we just duplicate the side of the tree without the point jitter. So let's just grab this bit, copy it across, and maybe make a little bit of space. And we want to pipe a blend shape into here with the hexagonal shape and a line. And let's maybe animate this with a keyframe at frame one and a keyframe at frame 240, going all the way up to number one. Oh, I put this after the point, I'm sorry about that. There we go. Let's copy this blend shape for the second one and copy it again for, and this is what we'll pipe into our merge. Uh, that's not quite right. So this one, actually, maybe this one should be more like this. There we go. If we we still have that full tessellation ghosted so we can see that that's working on the entire tessellation next we need to turn these into shapes instead of just lines so let's make again a little bit of room for ourselves let's just cut this for now first we'll need a fuse followed by a join this one will set to only connected so now that we have now we have a shape and then let's add a poly extrude. Let's extrude it by maybe 0 0.04. Now this gives a very crude shape. So let's run it through a simple VDB pipeline to make it look a little bit smoother. So let's drop down a VDB from polygons. With a voxel size of 0 0.005. Next, let's add a VDB smooth SDF. And the default settings look fine. Let's convert this back to polygon. So convert the VDB, set it to polygons, and let's give it an adaptivity of 0.1 to uh, keep the poly counts a little bit manageable. Now, in all of this, the shapes have shrunk a bit. So let's add a transform. Let's maybe scale them up by something like 1.125, and let's pipe them back into our copy to points. But we're not going to use this workflow in order to get that gradual morph to work. Instead, we're going to use mops. I'm going to assume you already have mops installed. If not, it's free, it's incredible, and you should go to motionoperators.com uh, to get it. So using mops, we're going to offset the playback of each of these shapes. And you can think of it as if you were putting a time shift into a for each loop uh, that's running over each of these shapes. Now, time shifts in for each loops don't work. Uh, so instead, we're using mops. First, we'll need to cash out our geo. And I'll put this in a folder called dollar hip name. Next, we'll drop down a mops instancer we'll need one instance object this will be a file 
and we can point it towards our VDB cache. And don't forget we had 240 frames, so this frame range is 240, and so we want to grab all 240 frames. In the distribution tab, we want to distribute based on a mesh. That mesh is our grid one, which we can just drag and drop into the template object, and we want to distribute based on the points. Great, that's the first half. Then we just copy this across and point it to grid number two for the second half. Now remember, the second half needed to be uh, transformed by 120 degrees. And so we drop down a MOPS transform modifier and transform everything 120 degrees in Y. And then we merge these two streams back together to get our full grid. What we can now do is add a MOPS shape falloff, preview this falloff and maybe rotate it 60 degrees in Y and give it a scale of maybe 2. And that'll give us a fall off to then use in a mops set sequence time. But before that, we need another wrangle actually, because we need to properly create our offset based on that mops fall off. So integer at offset is fitting our mops fall off, which runs from zero to one. And we wanted to go from zero to 240 because we had 240 frames. Next, in our mops set sequence time, we want the index type to be an attribute. The attribute was called offset. And we want to set the cycling mode to clamp it. And maybe let's just look at it flat shaded. And change the lighting type, maybe. And set the lighting type to simple. And there we go. We have the top left corner here being perfectly hexagonal and the bottom there being uh, our Escher style shapes. Actually, let's um, put our background to dark to see what we're doing a little bit better. And if we now go back to our mops shape fall off, we can move this one to change the behavior of our fall off, or we can set that back to zero and increase the width of the fall off. So you get something a little bit more subtle. And there we have our gradually morphing tessellation. So that's it. If you like this sort of thing, don't forget to take a look at that website from St. Louis University because it has all the various ways in which you can tessellate in an Escher style. And all of them have these really helpful gifts to explain how the symmetry works. In some cases, it's rotational. In some cases, it's translational. Sometimes it's mirroring. And the shapes change from the hexagons that we have here to uh, squares and uh, kites and all kinds of other shapes. Have fun and thanks for watching.